Let's continue our conversation with Dr. Peter Bogosian. Uh, Peter, an issue that I'm very interested in because I think that it is very often portrayed inaccurately uh, on the political spectrum by both sides is that issue of what is often called white privilege. Now, you've written about white privilege. For our conversation, I want to restrict our conversation to the United States specifically, and I think it'll sort of become relevant why as we go on. Do you no, believe good. that in the United States in 2017, there is any degree of what is colloquially referred to as white privilege? Yeah, can, can I ask what you mean by that? Because we may mean different things by that. I guess by, by white privilege, I mean an unearned deference that one has by virtue of being or being perceived as, and the perceived as will be relevant to our conversation, in yeah. a majority white country by virtue of being perceived as white. Do I think that that confers social or confers advantages on people? Sure. Yeah, I do. So talk a little bit about where you see white privilege as a real thing and where you think that some assertions about white privilege sort of go off the rails. Oh, this is a huge conversation. Uh, 15. How long do we have for this segment? <laughs> well, let's try um, it. I mean, I think let's consider it an overview conversation, something we might dig into in more detail at some future point. So is it more or less? So th this is an empirical question to which I do not have the data. It's outside my area of expertise, but this is a way that one would think about the problem. Is it more or less likely that somebody who's black or perceived as black would be pulled over by the police for a minor infraction in a vehicle than somebody who's white or perceived as white. My my hunch would be to say yes, um, although I watched the Larry uh, Elder and Dave Rubin video that really made me think that my uh, hmm. belief in this could be um, might not be as evidence based as it is. And I have to say, I don't have the evidence, but I do have what I think are good ways to think about the problem. Yeah. So, um, and then what are the, what are the consequences of that? What are the consequences for the criminal justice system? I mean, we know by and large that the criminal justice system is geared toward, um, money. So if you're wealthy, you have more opportunities to get off, even if you're guilty, frankly, uh, than, than if you're not. And we know that um, that poverty is, I wouldn't say endemic in the black community, but I would certainly say statistically there are larger numbers of African Americans living in poverty than there are uh, percentages of whites. So I do think that white privilege is something that's real. It may correspond to economics. It may also correspond to the fact that black on black crimes are perceived as, so again, that the whole issue is just so charged that we have, we have really created a, I'm, I'm, I noticed that I'm being um, far more judicious in my words because <laughs> I know that any misstatement or anything that I can say will be perceived as something else. I don't think we're ready to have an honest conversation about this. I think Interesting. we're very far from it. I mean, just to but give you like an anecdote, you know, I, I feel like I have white privilege despite being unclear as to as to uh, whether I'm white. And what I mean by that is I'm a Hispanic immigrant to the United States um, oh, whose from? ethnicity I'm from Argentina. My ethnicity is Ashkenazi Jewish, right? And I am sort of and I use the term lucky. Maybe it's not the exact right term, but I have benefited from the reality that I moved to the U.S. when I was five instead of 10 and thus lost my accent when speaking English. And yeah. because my ancestry ethnically uh, is European Ashkenazi Jewish, I also am perceived as white. Now, social class being the same, education you're, being you're the same. Excuse me. Excuse me, you're visually perceived as white. Visually perceived as white, yeah. Okay. So holding my social class level and sort of my education level uh, th the same as it is, I am yeah. very aware that when I have an interaction with police, um, my ability to um, say what I think is concerning about their behavior if I see them harassing someone on the street or when they show up at a, at a loud wedding party that I'm at, like I was at last week, if yeah. I had darker skin, and had learned English five years later and thus had an accent, 
my intelligence would be the same, my social class, you know, holding everything else equal, my re relationship with the police might be different. My comfort level in being sar sarcastic yeah, or indifferent would be I, different. So I think that this is sort of an interesting right. idea that I've lived myself, you know? Yeah, I, I think everything you said, while I don't have any evidence for it, I don't have faith in it, I think it's probably true. Mm. I think it's probably true. Let me, if, if I may interject something else, this is kind of a secret I don't want anybody to know, but it's a good reveal on your show. If you think having white privilege is something, wait until you get to be my age. Then you actually see it. Hmm. I mean, the, you know, gray hair, older guy privilege is awesome. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, people, everybody, it seems like just yesterday I'd walk into a store when I was a teenager and people would think I'm going to steal stuff. And a little while ago I was in a store and someone said, oh, sir, I need to leave. Can you watch the store for me? <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, but yeah, even when you go somewhere, you know, like I go and I don't have my ID on me and I need to go to a bar a few drinks and I just point to my head and people go, oh, okay. Um, but I have definitely felt old age, older age, I don't think I'm old age yet, but I've definitely felt middle age privilege among the police. People call, everybody calls me sir. So I, I think that there are definitely, you can extrapolate outward from that. Uh, and you can listen to the sincere testimony or or when people say, look, you know, I don't feel comfortable. And it's not just the police. I think it's a general attitude. I think the police have an extremely difficult job and they're caught between some bad laws like some drug laws and enforcing those laws. And they're caught between um, the the fact – this is when we get – this is when the conversation gets very tricky. But – uh, and not tricky in terms of facts, but just tricky in terms of the political implications that one draws from those facts. I, I think that the if you look at the uh, majority of – you just need to look at the majority of crimes, uh, specifically violent crimes and murders. And I think that, that – and again, I don't have access to, those, to these data, and I'm happy to change my mind. But it is my impression that a black man is far more likely to be killed by another black man – than a white man is to be uh, killed by a black man. Well, that um, that that's true. But where that often goes off the rails is that if you are white, you're basically just as likely to be the victim of another white person uh, a grieving you uh, than yeah, if you are black. And you know, it's basically it's intra-racial violence is what's white. happening. That's just because there are more whites. That's just a statistical thing. Well, there's more whites who could be victims and more whites who could be perpetrators in the same way, right? Yeah. I mean, it's proportional. Well, if you look at the number of homicides, and again, I'm getting out of my area now, so I'm yeah. a little, little uncomfortable about speaking about this stuff. But if you look at the, the number of homicides, and here's how we know that, um, of, of black people who have been killed by other black people, um, and then we look at, we match those to the incarceration rates of black people, and you say, well, how do you know it wasn't someone else? Because we get that from the eyewitness testimony of people who perceive other people's races a certain way. You can say, well, that testimony is biased. Okay, maybe it is. I don't really know. I'm not a, an expert in witness testimony. Um, but I think it's very difficult for the police because they're trying to do the job, and I think we have to ascribe <clears throat> excuse me, good motivations to the overwhelming majority of police officers. They're trying to do an, an incredibly difficult job and save people's lives, and they're confronted by some pretty ghastly statistics that accord with their own personal experiences. And look, this is what I think we should do. You want to know? Here's what I think we should do. Yeah. And here's why I think what I think we should do will absolutely never in a million years happen. And this will tell you how toxic our current environment is. We need to have experts on, and I am not one of these people by any stretch of the imagination. We need to have experts on pol uh, policing and the rules of policing and public policy and when force is used and when and we need to have those people have a discussion maybe even a debate if you want with excuse me activists in the community I, black lives matter I wouldn't say so but and we need to have that conversation at a university and we need to have a civil conversation and we need to really seek for what Jurgen Habermas calls mutual understanding could you fathom that happening It'd no, be practically speaking pretty difficult. You, yeah, I mean, it would be no, tough. It would it'd be, be tough. No, it would not even be very, it would not, it would be, you could never have that conversation. So we- I think I could do it. I think have, I could moderate that and have some degree of success if okay. we had the right people in the room. I would love for you to, you do this, I'll fly out to BC, you're teaching at BC. You say, look, I would love, <laughs> love to see the administrator's face when you tell them this. I 
I think that we should have a that I would like to moderate a conversation between people. Now, get actual policemen, not people who who are professors who theorize about the police. Get people who are actually involved in these. Um, decisions and it can explain to people and then get people on the other side of the room try to bring them together have a civil conversation I don't think any administrator will, will approve it because I don't think we're ready to have those conversations I think that uh, people are afraid that violence will erupt and I think there's a good reason people are afraid to, that violence will erupt but that's the kind of conversation we need we need to have mutual under we need to seek mutual understanding between members of the community and members of the police for example why should you when the police and even I do this with my gray hair privilege, when the when the police pull you over, why should you keep your hands on the steering wheel? Well, you should keep your hands on the steering wheel because there have been many instances, and I've seen them, I've seen these videos myself, where people then pull guns out and shoot the cops. So we need to look at this issue from both sides, and I don't think it's simply as easy as um, systemic racism. I think that the police have an incredibly difficult job to do. But to get back to your earlier point, I do think there's white privilege. I do think that there's value and meaning in talking about that. And I do think that if we're honest about that and we can communicate about that, then we can go. Healing is a goofy word, but it really is the word that applies. We can try to heal these deep divisions. One more thing, we can do that by appealing to super, what's called in the literature super identity. So super identities were all Americans. Remember right after 9-11, for the yep. first time, everybody was super civil and you wanted to get into traffic, people let you go. That lasted about 10 days, maybe two weeks tops. But we can appeal <laughs> to commonalities that we have so that we can sh solve these problems. That's why the most important thing that we can do is to have a conversation. And David, you would be the really, you really would be among the most perfect people to attempt to broker that conversation. Wow. If you could do that, you would really have something extraordinary on your hands. Well, I can't think of a better place to take our last break than that. We will wrap up with Dr. Peter Bogosian next.